And with that, let's uh, go to our guest line and bring on our first guest today. As promised, we are going to talk some women's college basketball now. We're pleased to be joined by Michael Volpel from ESPN. Michael, great to have you on. How are you today? Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Big time for uh, certainly the women's game. And, you know, we saw uh, Caitlin Clark in Iowa against Angel Reese in LSU and setting records in terms of, you know, how many people were watching. Is, is this the, the height of, of women's college basketball right now in, in terms of, you know, the length of time you've been covering it? Is this the, the best the game has, has, has been, the healthiest, I guess, the game has been here in America? You know, I think um, in terms of the eyes that are on the game, I, I would say that's probably true. And uh, there's probably a few reasons for that. Obviously, NIL really gave these players a chance to have a platform. So if you, even if you didn't watch women's basketball, you might have seen Caitlin Clark's uh, State Farm commercial. You might have um, heard her name. And I, I think that's been the thing, you know, with women's um sports in general, but certainly women's basketball, is just getting people to sort of tune in, uh, get familiar with the storylines. And, um, you know, as you guys know, the game's been good for a long time, but having people be interested, um, you know, in, in individual players and teams, that's something we've seen grown a lot. So, yeah, I would say, you know, this Final Four from that perspective is uh, is the peak. And it seems like you've got, you know, two matchups tonight uh, in Cleveland with, with great storylines, right? You've got South Carolina undefeated against uh, NC State, one of the best teams out of the ACC. The other game, you've got, you know, perennial power UConn taking on Caitlin Clark in Iowa. Um, I guess let's start with this first game. I see South Carolina is an 11.5 point favorite. Are you surprised by that number? Do you think this one's going to be a, a lopsided affair, or do you think NC State could keep it close? I think the way that the Wolfpack have played, especially in the tournament, um, gives you an idea that they, they can keep this close. And I would say probably that's true also in South Carolina. They didn't play especially well in the regional, though they won it. Um, you know, they, those games against uh, both Indiana and against Oregon State, you know, pretty much went to the, the wire or close to it. So they did dig deep, play well to win those games. A little different, you know, than, than last year's undefeated South Carolina team. What's interesting, guys, is I think at the beginning of the year, um, NC State was not the ACC team you know, that everybody thought would, you know, potentially be at the Final Four. But they they played well in the tournament. Their um, their guards especially, and, and guard play is so big uh, in the tournament that that's been the thing that's um, that's gotten them this far. So I do think it'll be an interesting matchup, and you kind of like having those uh, sort of contrasts, if you will, the undefeated team versus the team nobody really expected to be here uh, meeting in a national semifinal. It, you you know, and this question kind of goes back to the first one I asked you. You've got Caitlin Clark, and we just saw, you know, Angel Reese and Paige Becker's playing tonight, and there's so many individual stars in the game right now. Do you think that's the reason why, and, and maybe I'm wrong here, but it feels like South Carolina isn't getting the same kind of publicity like an undefeated team normally would. Is, is that why? Because there's so, so many individual stars now in the game? And, and do you think South Carolina is getting a, its just due nationally? I think that's. I think you hit the nail on the head. It's the South Carolina team is um, a, a team that doesn't have a big star like they did last year with Aaliyah Boston. They have a lot of really good players, but it's also a team where you have like you know eight, nine players um, that that are all really good. You know, best player overall probably Camila Cardoso is six seven center. She was the regional's most outstanding player. But then you look on the other side and you have more of the star power of teams. I think it's that way in most sports. People do look for star players. And that's probably the reason why, if it seems like, you know, South Carolina, shouldn't they be the, the biggest story here? Um, part of it is that they don't have that one player that people automatically recognize. But boy, as a team, they're really deep, by far the, the deepest team in terms of talent at this Final Four. It's got to be hard for Syracuse fans watching this Final Four. You mentioned Camilla Cardoso. You know, she, of course, started her career at Syracuse. And, man, it would have been fun watching her, you know, with De'Asia Fair. And, uh, you know, they had a great year without her. But if you, you had that big piece in the middle, who knows what this year could have been like uh, for Syracuse. You go to that second uh, semifinal game. We talked about NC State, South Carolina. How about UConn, Iowa? I mean, what an intriguing matchup. And every time I think, you know, can Caitlin Clark do it by herself, she she does. You know, I mean, I know she's got a supporting cast there, but, you know, the 
the performance you put on against LSU, very impressive with the 41 points and uh, the assists and the eight made threes and, and everything that she she did that night. Um, do you think UConn can can knock her off, or do you think Caitlin can can do it again and, and get her team uh, into the finals? How, how do you see this game kind of uh, shaking out? I, you know, I honestly think it's a toss-up. Both of these teams um, have similar strengths. You know, with with uh, Caitlin Clark and Paige Beckers being star-level players. Overall, UConn, you know, they're the ones that have all the you know five-star recruits. It's not Iowa other than Caitlin Clark. Um, that's why I think this is going to be a really tight game. I wouldn't be surprised at all if this game goes down to the wire. Clark has been phenomenal, and and I say that as somebody who's been fortunate enough. I've I've seen every game she's played in person since I think the beginning of February. I've been at all of her games, and I thought the the other night against LSU was the best game she's played um, of of that entire series. With like you said, forty one points, twelve assists, really kept her cool in that game uh, to get back to a Final Four. So. She was great last year in the national semifinals against South Carolina. She had 41 points in that game, and I think she's going to have to have another big performance tonight for Iowa to uh, to advance to the championship game. Do you think her legacy will change at all by winning a national title? Like, d- does she need that national title to kind of take things to another level for her? Or, you know, when I when I look at Caitlin Clark, I'm I'm thinking to myself, I'm not sure her legacy can be much better than it is right now. You know, it's interesting because you think of there's so many great players on both the men's and women's side who never won a national championship in college. I I just think that's so much about you only have those four years. So now occasionally some of these, you know, the COVID returners have five, but it's only four years. It has so much to do with the, the coaching staff, the style of play, your teammates around you. You think of you know great players like, for instance, Dawn Staley, who you know coaches South Carolina. She didn't win a national championship. Lisa Leslie never made a Final Four on the women's side. So I know there are people who say you have to win a championship. I think honestly, I look at that more as like a test when you're a professional, when you can sort of determine more about your career. You have more years. I think there's a, a little bit more of a gauge of winning when you're a pro. To me, Caitlin Clark scored more points than anybody in the history of Division One basketball, men or women. She's at 3,900 now and over 1,000 assists. It'd be icing on the cake to have a national championship, but she's taken a program to two consecutive Final Fours. That's pretty great. Yeah, I'm with you there. Uh, all right, let's 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 turn our attention, if we could, to, to DeAsia Fair for a couple of minutes here. And, um, you know, I remember when she announced she was transferring in and following Felicia Leggett Jack, and, you know, Paulie and I do the show, and we were like, well, you know, she played at Buffalo. She was great there, but, you know, it w- how will she be at a Power 5 school? And, and and she surpassed everybody's expectations. And now I feel like she's facing a lot of the same questions. You know, yeah, she was great in college, but, it, you know, how's she going to be at the next level? What, what are your thoughts on DeAsia Fair, her game, and do you think it will translate to the WNBA? I've talked to a lot of coaches and GMs in the WNBA, and there's always the concern, um, which she knows so well all her life about size, you know, with her being 5'5". But you're talking about somebody who has been one of the great scorers that we've seen in women's college basketball. And I, and I think you guys are 100% right. She, she came into the ACC and proved she could play at the top level. What I've been hearing is that a lot of people think she is late first round or second round. So I would think that's probably the area that she's going to go in. When you have somebody who has been this successful as a scorer, I, I think somebody will want to give her a look. Um, and they know that she's she's a really determined a young woman because she's heard you're too small for a long time. That's not going to phase her. She, she's heard that. Um, and I do want to say, yeah, for Syracuse listeners, I, I've thought that same thing. How cool would it have been to see Cardoso and Sarah on the same team? Things didn't work out that way, but um, but you know I think Fair has been just a terrific player um, in the ACC the last couple of years, and I, I'm really eager to see her prove herself at the next level. Yeah, and just talking about draft stock here, so I remember at the beginning of the year she really wasn't showing up on on mock drafts at all, and now she's worked her way into uh, you know I saw her as high as number ten recently. Um, is I mean, do you think that's about where she will go? I mean, what what should SU fans expect on on draft night for DeAsia Fair? I think she's prop. Like I said, I think late first round, early second round. Now I wouldn't be freaked out if she doesn't go first round. Uh, 
what I've always found is sometimes what, what coaches and GMs will tell you before isn't always what they decide on, you know, on draft day. But the ones I've talked to really like a lot about her game. And so that's where I feel like, like I said, if, if you don't see her name in that first round, I, it's going to come up in the second round. And, you know, in terms of where people move, the other thing that's you know, been weird about this year is you still had the, the COVID waiver. And who, uh, for, for instance, like a Georgia Amore with Virginia Tech, she was a player that probably would have gone first round, but she's coming back to college. That impacted how those mocks were sort of playing out over the course of the year as well. You know, I, I did want to ask you a question about the, the portal. And, you know, we see it in the men's game. And in two weeks, more than a 1,000 uh, players had hit the portal in the men's game. And I, I wasn't sure what would happen with, like, the Syracuse women, for instance. They have this, you know, this solid core. They went on this great run this year. They're losing the Asia Fair. But everybody else, for the most part, was eligible to come back. Uh, most of the pieces. And then, you know, we've seen in recent days, there's a report out there that Alyssa Latham, their star freshman, has, has decided to hit the portal. Do you think that we're going to see the level of, of women hitting the portal that, that we are seeing in the men's game? Or, or would you be surprised if it continues to grow in that direction? You know, I do think, uh, for better or worse, there's going to continue to be a lot of movement in the portal. It becomes difficult because... Players will see either somebody they know very well or somebody maybe they play with is going. They start second-guessing their own decision. There's a big, you know, is the grass green or someplace else? It's, it's interesting with somebody like Haley Van Liff, who left Louisville and went to LSU, and now she's living in LSU. So the, the grass isn't always greener. The thing I worry about sometimes is players who go into the portal and then actually don't find a good spot uh, af- after they're, they're in the portal. But it's um, – what do you say? I mean, it, it, in some ways it's just that is today's game, and it means the decisions that those kids make – um, when they're in when they're in high school, aren't necessarily going to stick. A lot of them aren't, and so coaches are kind of uh, they're they're recruiting twenty four seven because they're now they're even recruiting their own teams. Right after a season, they're right. recruiting to keep the players that they have. All right, I'm going to ask you one more question. It's it's kind of coming up in our, our chat section. I see some of our listeners uh, debating uh, Brianna Stewart versus Caitlin Clark in terms of college career. You know, we uh, uh, we identify uh, Brianna Stewart with Syracuse. She played here locally at, at Cicero North Syracuse High School, and, and we've kind of followed her career every step of the way. Uh, does Brianna need to worry that, that Caitlin's going to surpass her? I mean, a lot of people look at, at Brianna right now as, you know, best college career ever. If Caitlin Clark punctuates it with a championship, does, does Brianna have to worry about her uh, her spot on that list? I always say nobody can pass Brianna Stewart. She had four national championships. She was the most outstanding player of all of those final fours. You can't have a better career than that, so I would say no. And then she's going to the WNBA. She's been a champion in the WNBA. She's been a gold medalist. She's been WNBA MVP. I mean, Caitlin would be the first one to say, boy, if, I, if I'm if i even in a conversation with somebody like Brianna Stewart, <laughs> she would be thrilled. So, no, as far as I'm concerned, uh, uh, I would say, you know, Stewie is the gold standard of uh-huh. women's college players. You just can't get better than what she did. All right, Michael, you just gained a lot of, uh, of, of fans here in Syracuse by saying that. I can tell you that. Uh, Michael, great stuff. Great analysis. Thanks so much for coming on. Enjoy the Final Four, and hopefully we can uh, talk again down the road. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. All right, Michael Vopel uh, joining us here.